Hi, this is Dr. Nadine Rosechild Sullivan, and I'm coming to you talking about the history of race and the history of um, race-based slavery and about the aftermath of that, particularly in the United States, but in at some level in the Americas. The history is real and it does not change, and it is simply factual, right? It's not something that is um, that, that is modified, it's not something that's alternative. It is where we have been. We must know where we have been to be able to assess where we are. And as a thinking species of beings to know where we want to go, to decide where we want to go in the future. Most of us probably feel like we know something about the history of race-based slavery in the United States or in the Americas in general, but a few facts before we move into a little bit more recent um, time. The, um, the Middle Passage was the transport route, the transatlantic slave trade from Africa, from the uh, west coast of Africa over to the Americas. And this was ongoing from 1560 till 1850, even though it was outlawed by Britain and at some level by the United States around 1808, it still continued nonetheless legally or illegally. But over this period of 300 years, so you've got Columbus in 1492 and, and the things he was doing, but you've got this really serious transatlantic passage, um, this middle passage of this transport of captured and, and Africans brought and enslaved in, um, in the Americas in general over this 300 year period. The most active years were from 1700 to 1808. And during that time, about 40% of the Africans who were captured uh, to be enslaved were transported in British and American ships and without ventilation or sufficient water, about 15% grew sick and died on the passage, right? So, uh, so many didn't make it um, here. There were an estimated 15 to 20 million Africans transported to the Americas at large, right? 15 to 20 million. More than 400,000 of those or 4% of those who survived the Middle Passage were brought to the 13 colonies, the British colonies that became the United States. 4.8 million were transported to Brazil, 4.7 million to the Caribbean, and, um, and in 1619, 20 Africans were arrived in Virginia. In 1637, the ship named Desire left Salem, Massachusetts, carrying Native Americans who had been taken captive from the Pequot Pequot, Pequot, I'm not sure how to say that tribe's name, sorry, war to be sold as slaves in the Caribbean. But that ship returned to Massachusetts with Africans imported into the Northern English colonies. An estimated 166 transatlantic voyages embarked out of Boston and back. So the North was very implicated in slavery, in the slave trade, um, you know, just all part of it for, for literally, um, you know, decades and decades and hundreds of years, um, depending on which piece we're looking at. And so in 1808, when um, the US and Britain banned the transatlantic slave owner, um, one of the things that was done to continue to create a population of slaves in the Americas was, um, trigger warning, was the intentional rape of African slaves by their air quotes owners um, with the intention of creating babies that would then be enslaved. Because in the United States, um, anyone who was born to an enslaved mother was dedicated, was, uh, was designated as a slave, whether or not um, their father was white, whether or not, no matter what percentage of their bloodline, you know, whatever, you were designated your freedom, or if, you're, if your mother were black but free, then you were designated as free. So your um, free or enslaved status was was designated based on your mom's. Um, this past, so, you know, slavery is there, it's going on. You know that the Civil War was fought in large part over the question of slavery and over the question of Western territories that were being brought in and incorporated into the United States as the indigenous population was being driven out, was being removed, was being subjugated, was being murdered in a genocide, as all of those things were going on with the indigenous Americans or you know, not what we now call Native Americans, but they were here for 17,000 years or more before this was called America. Um, 
but that which was happening to those populations. Um, those, the, the land they had inhabited was being called, was being called US territory and then being incorporated as states. And there was conflict in what you know, was already the United States over whether these territories would be incorporated as, um, as states in which there was slavery was allowed or it states, as states in which slavery was not allowed. You get into the 1800s, you get into especially the 1830s to the 1860s, and you have a really strong abolitionist movement, a social justice movement arising in the United States that is making demands and that it, it you know, really working hard. Um, African-American and, and European-American people's fighting against, you know, against slavery, fighting for the abolition of slavery. Part of bringing us up to the conflict of the Civil War is there's those fighting to maintain that status quo and those fighting to make the change for social justice. And that conflict is going on and it erupts into the Civil War in 1860 and in 1865 with the end of the Civil War um, those who were enslaved, especially by then, most of the northern states had manumitted or their slaves, but um, most of those in the southern states were still enslaved and so are declared, you know, free with the end of the Civil War. During the Civil War, President Lincoln made an emancipation proclamation that had, you know, some good purposes behind it and some outcomes, but at some level it was also the president of the Union say it was the president of the United States, but the South had split off and had, had seceded from the Union, had declared itself the Confederacy and um, had declared itself with the new president. And so, you know, the president of the Union was telling the Confederacy, your slaves are free. And the Confederacy was saying, no, I, you're not the president of me. And so, so the Emancipation Proclamation did not have a lot of weight until the end of the Civil War. And then with the end of the Civil War, those slaves are declared free, um, but many weren't told. And so one of the reasons you heard may have heard a little over the last year or two, or you may have known for a long time about Juneteenth, but Juneteenth was the fact that it was months after the end of the Civil War before slaves in Texas were, or now ex-slaves in Texas were told, oh, by the way, that war ended a few months ago and um, you're not enslaved anymore. And so Juneteenth is kind of like this last moment at which most black Americans in the South become aware of the fact that, um, that they're allowed to leave now if they want from where they were. A lot of things go into play though. If you've been born and raised somewhere and everybody you know either still is on this plantation or neighboring plantations or is lost to you because because they were sold to someplace else and you don't know where, um, you know, everybody you know your world is right here. And so somebody, and you've been denied an education, part of race-based slavery in the United States was to forbid by law educating slaves. You were, they were forbidden to learn reading and writing, forbidden so, and, and anybody who was not enslaved was forbidden to teach them to read or write. So there's not any level of that kind of education among the enslaved population. And so as they're liberated, it's like, okay, you can go now. But um, you know, some had some skills, blacksmithing or whatever, but most had farming skills or domestic service skills because that's all they'd been permitted to do. And so pretty quickly, a system goes into place of sharecropping and domestic servitude that it's like, I don't know where to go. And this, this happened actually with concentration camps. It happened with Japanese Americans and they had former skills because they were only in the camps a few, a number, a couple of years during the uh, World War II. But, you know, there was nowhere left to, no place to go back to if I were taken and put into a concentration camp and my home and my business were taken and given to or uh, squatted in and occupied by others who then said, no, it's mine now, not yours. And all of my possessions were gone. I'd left with a suitcase and all I have is a suitcase to leave the camp with and there's nowhere to go back to. Some people just sort of stayed for a few months while they tried to figure out what to do. Well, while some African-Americans were staying in place trying to figure out where do I go? And what, you know, what do I do now? Um, in, as that was happening, the former slave owners 
with, who still had plantations and still had farms and cotton and whatever to be, you know, harvested, they said, you know, we will cut you, you know, we'll give you this little bit, tiny bit of money, and we'll give you this little bit of the crop if you'll still work for me, you know, whatever. And so they made this sort of deal with their former slaves. If you'll keep doing the labor you were doing for me, I won't own you and you'll get paid. But the way it was, it worked out year by year by year, you'd go into <clears throat> deeper debt to the former slave owner because somehow you had to pay him for your hoe and your seeds and you know you didn't end up making a profit. But so sharecropping was a an ongoing system of of um, subjugation and impoverishment that stayed in place. Another factor that stays in place in that time is something I'm not going to talk about in depth in this video, which was the factor of peonage. There were um, black laws passed that were there to um, easily and uh, easily capture someone for a minor offense or the accusation of a minor offense and then incarcerate them and use them for free labor. It's part of our history of mass incarceration to be talked about a different day because I actually want to move into talking about the Tulsa race massacre. So uh, one of the things that had happened during slavery was that every white man over a certain age, 16 or 18, in any given state, <clears throat> especially of the South, had to patrol the woods at night looking for runaways. So in slaves that had, in states that had slavery still, so some of the Northern states had given up their, um, had, had, you know, made slavery illegal, had abolished slavery somewhat earlier. Um, but New York state didn't do it until 1827, which is really essentially like, you know, 30 years before the end of the Civil War. It's like not a long time in the realm of history effects, but um, in Southern states, young men or old men, all men, no matter whether the men had money or didn't have money, men of all socioeconomic classes who were white, had, were, um, you had to go join the slave patrols and go ride with them looking for runaways. And so the woods were patrolled constantly at night for anybody who would try to slip away from their air quotes owner. And so that already existed as this, as this, um, force, right? It is actually the origin of our policing systems. But as the Civil War ends and slaves are declared free, there's like this little window of time. And then there's the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, which rises out of the slave patrollers, the paddy rollers. And so those, young, those men of all ages move over into becoming Klan members. And while they can't patrol the woods looking for slaves who don't have the proper, you know, paper saying they can be off the plantation at this hour. While they can't do that, what they can do is become a terrorizing force to African Americans living in, in mostly in the South, but anywhere really, because there were Klan contingents in, in Northern states as well. Um, and we know some relatively um, well-known people who were part of the Klan. Um, so anyway, so leaving that alone for a minute. Um, so the Klan rises and is this, you know, becomes an enormous force. Um, by the time we get to times like World War I and President Woodrow Wilson and the movie Birth of a Nation, and that helps facilitate an explosion of Klan membership. And the President Woodrow Wilson is showing Birth of a Nation in the White House and, and instituting real, you know, heavy racial segregation in the White House workforce, but also in those so there's this brief window of reconstruction after the end of the Civil War, during which African Americans get the right to vote, get declared citizens. There's constitutional amendments that go through. There's some forward motion. There are a lot of Black um, senators and, and House of Representatives members in Southern states, and then you know, so Black politicians coming into play. And then there's all of this shutting down at the end of Reconstruction, and all of these states passing Jim Crow laws, so that you have this Jim Crow enforcement in the South by law in the North, in fact, anyway. So de jure and de, de facto segregation is locked into place. And with that being locked into place, the Klan is there making sure, uh, enforcing this racial segregation, enforcing that there's not mixed dating, there's not mixed marriages, there's not mixed race children, you know, in, in large measure, unless of course, you know, they um, themselves uh, part, you know, 
there's a history of rape by white men of black women in that in that era also but there's this something that goes into play right and with it what begins to happen is what is known as racial cleansing or ethnic cleansing it's a forced removal of people from land so for a moment okay on just a little bit ago um, may 31st and june 1st this is june 5th may 31st and june 5th so memorial day and the day after are the 100 were the 100th anniversary of the tulsa race massacre okay so for a moment, it's not the first one, but let's go there first because some survivors of the Tulsa race massacre testified in Congress on the 19th of May, 2021. And so there was a massacre and burning of Tulsa's successful black community, the Greenwood district, also known as Black Wall Street. There were a number of um, television documentaries and work being done. Um, one, uh, Tremaine Lee put out Blood on Black Wall Street that came, that came out this week, um, you know, around this whole Memorial Day thing, um, this anniversary, this 100th anniversary. But the white community turned on the residents of, so Tulsa had a, had a section, the Greenwood District, and it, there were Black owned businesses and, black, and residential property ownership, you know, black home, home ownership in this district. And it was very, very, it was a thriving, it had to build a thriving community, right? Where black people were, you know, shopping from each other and had, had, owning stores and, you know, just like real black empowerment, economic empowerment and living in a real community that was happening here. And the white community turned and drove them out at rifle point. There was some, well, a young black man got in an elevator. There was a white woman on the elevator. There was, you know, accusations about what happened on the elevator. His family says that she and he were actually consensual dated, consensually dating. Um, you know, the white community said, you know, he touched her. I don't know, whatever. But um, so it erupted around this and the white community turned and drove out the black community at rifle point. They also dropped bombs from airplanes onto the homes and the businesses in the Greenwood district of Tulsa. And they burnt the homes and the businesses down over their heads, right? Children in the houses and the house has gone on fire. Met white men with torches coming and setting your curtains on fire while your children are hiding under the bed and, and the house is burning down around you. And so what happened is there were up to and, and counts differ because in situations like that, government doesn't do a good job of keeping an accurate, accurate track, right? They diminish. So the government's like, oh, 10 people died. But actually the count in the African-American community is that there were up to 300 African-American citizens killed that day. And there were eight to 10,000 of them left homeless. And 23 churches were burnt to the ground in Greenwood and more than 1,200 homes were destroyed, at, at which, was a, um, which was up to, which was a $200 million property ownership loss for the black community. And, and they were driven out, right? And so survived, the survivors who testified to Congress on Wednesday, May 19th, 2021, where Mother Viola Ford Fletcher, who testifies, she's 107 years old, and she was seven years old at the time of the massacre. Um, Leslie Bennington Randall, 106, was six years old at the massacre, and the younger brother of Mother Fletcher, Hugh Van Ellis, is 100 years old. He was an infant at the time of the massacre. He's also a World War II veteran. The three of them testified to Congress, uh, Mother Fletcher and Leslie Bennington Randall testified about their memories of the bombing and, and the mobs and the, and the murders and, the, and just the terror of it all. Mother Fletcher testified that there hasn't been a day of her entire hundred years since that day in which her life has not been affected by the memories in which she doesn't still hear the cries and smell the, the smoke and, and just, you know, and live that terror of having her home and her family attacked and having to flee and, and run to survive from that massacre. But one of the things that didn't get mentioned a lot in the, in the news coverage for this 100th anniversary was the fact that this was not an isolated event. Black Wall Street was particularly thriving, but it was not the only thriving Black community 
it was not the only full thriving black business district or or neighborhood or town where the residents were thriving it was not the only place where there was a massacre or where there was land theft and forced removal and so not only was it not the only place this was absolutely commonplace to the point where up to one third of the landmass of the contiguous United States, right? So we're excluding Alaska and Hawaii from this particular stat, but the 48 contiguous United States, up to one third of that landmass, north, south, east, and west, was cleared of its black populations, right? So like literally this was continuous. So it actually begins back around 1870 and continues on into the 1950s. So 1921 is not the start. Okay, so I'm gonna read through some of this list of uh, this. So this is largely vigilante violence. Oftentimes there is also state involvement in that law enforcement officers may have been part of it in a given area. Certainly, you know, in Alabama, there was nothing about the law that was opposed to this kind of mob violence. But it's, it's I, I want you to think about also, you know, put yourself in these shoes, whomever, however you are embodied, whatever race or ethnicity or, you know, immigrant status or, you know, gender or whatever socioeconomic class, whatever, however you inhabit this earth, however you're embodied in your intersections of identities, as you are here in this space, put yourself in the space for a moment of being a black resident of any of these spaces or their descendants. Because if my grandfather had owned something significant, um, one of the things that was mentioned in some of the footage about Black Wall Street is the um, is a descendant whose grandfather or great grandfather owned the most prosperous hotel in that space and what that hotel would have been worth in today's dollars and how you know if he had been the Hilton like like their family is not all the, like what are the repercussions over two or three generations and we're not actually talking that long ago I mean I know I'm no longer all that young but I also knew people in my family tree who were born in the late 1800s right and so and I had family, I, I knew great grandparents who were born in the 1880s and 1890s in my own family. And so, you know, we're just talking where if, if I'm, you know, Mother Fletcher's um, descendant, where, you know, we're talking, she could be my great grandmother, like we're talking just simply not that long ago, right? We're just talking back two generations or just, well, pair of three parents grandparents, great grandparents, and what that means to a family. So most of us inherit something, if our family has anything to inherit. It doesn't go with them to the other side. When our ancestors die off, it's left to their descendants. And some of us are fortunate enough to have some inherited wealth. Whether, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a lot. It can be a little house in, the, in you know, in town. It, it may not be much. And, you know, um, if you're like me, one of 12, when you inherit one twelfth of something, there's not much there. But, um, you know, most of us are also not one of 12. So, and anyway, so what does it mean if my great grandfather or my grandfather owned this important chunk of land and now that chunk of land has been squatted upon was what he was it was taken from him by theft or by murder and theft and and my family driven out and displaced and that wealth has gone down and accrued to someone white instead of to my family so just think how that would feel if you were there because it has a huge economic impact on African Americans in the United States when you realize that a third of the landmass of the United States experienced this. So we're literally talking about many, many, many African Americans in the United States whose grandparent or great grandparent or great great grandparent, depending on your age, actually had property and your family was divested of it generation by generation in different ways. But this is this is that space. So in 18, between the 1870s and the 1940s, I'm gonna need my glasses. Um, Winnedote, Michigan, African, African Americans were expelled from Winnedote, Michigan on multiple occasions across these uh, seven decades, right? The 1870s to the 1940s. 
on April 13th, 1873. So that's not even 10 years after the end of the Civil War, right? That's only eight years after the end of the Civil War. In Pollock, P-O-L-L-O-C-K, Louisiana, the small black population of Pollock left the town after the massacre of more than 100 blacks in nearby Colfax, Louisiana. On November 1st, 1878, in Salina, Tennessee, Salina's black population, that was Salina with a C, left on November 1st, 1878, after being subject to a series of violent actions over the course of several months. In 1886, in Comanche County, Texas, white residents expelled blacks from Comanche County because of alleged crimes committed by black men. And understand when you were expelled, then that area was declared white only. And that town, that county or that town would become what was known as a sundown town, right? It was lower sunset town. And it was basically don't let the sun catch you in, um, you know, Comanche County, Texas, right? So you could come there in later generations, you could come there to work, you could come there as a domestic or a farmhand, but you better go home and you better be out of town by sunset. Um, so you weren't allowed, when the community was driven out, that land became white only and, and likely remains so to this time. Um, in 1888, from 1888 through 1908, a number of race riots occurred in Paragould, Arkansas resulting in most of the town's 150 black residents leaving. 1892, the same happens in Lexington, Oklahoma. 1893, happens in Blackwell, Oklahoma. June 20th, 1894, Monet, Missouri, Monet's black population was expelled after the lynching of a black man who killed a white man during a fight. The Monet expulsion was the first of a number of violent expulsions in Southwestern Missouri between 1894 and 1906. 1896, Linton, Indiana, so not the South, right? Linton, Linton, Indiana, 300 black strike breakers were expelled from the coal mining town of Linton after one of the strike breakers shot a white boy. Eventually blacks were banned from living in all of Greene County. Um, Elwood, Indiana, August 27th, 1897. In Wilmington, Delaware on 1898, there was what was known as the Wilmington Coup where leaving um, the estimates are between 60 to 300 black dead, but white militia sought to overthrow the local government of Wilmington, Delaware. Yeah, okay, that was 1898. April 10th, 1899, Panna, Illinois, gun battle between striking white miners and strike breaker black miners resulted in the deaths of five blacks and two whites, as well as the expulsion of Panna's Black population. September 17th, 1899, Carterville, Illinois, a violent shootout occurred between striking white coal miners and non-union Black miners who were brought into Carterville as strike breakers. Five Black miners are killed. All of the surviving Black miners left Carterville shortly after the riot. February 20th, 1901. We're still not up to 1921, right? To 1901, Mena, Arkansas, most of Mena's black population left town after a black man named Peter Berryman was lynched for allegedly assaulting a white girl. August 18, 1901, Pierce City, Missouri, and this is one of the um, one of the situations covered in the film, a documentary film called Banished. I highly recommend the movie Banished for its discussion of what it means economically down through the generations as well. But Pierce City, Missouri, um, 300 black residents were expelled after white residents lynched three black men for allegedly killing a white woman. There were a lot of accusations, no evidence. When you lynch someone, there's no trial, right? There's no actually convicting, there's no evidence offered in court. You just simply accuse this person, you know, a white man killed the white woman, he just got away with it. And, uh, you know, all you had to do was point the finger that way on the color line. And that would be all there was to it. June 190, and that's been tried in recent times. Well, it might have been the 90s, but there was a white woman who drove her car with her babies in the backseat into a body of water. Um, she got out, um, like she's got it into the, like she started it and let it go, um, drowning her own children. I don't know what was, you know, wrong with her, but it's clearly something. Uh, but, you know, then she claimed her car had been hijacked by a black man with her kids in it. 
and you know then it came out it was actually her who did it um but you know she was doing that pointing the finger in the color, direction of the color line june 1902 in De decatur indiana a mob of 50 men forced black residents out of decatur um april 16th um, 1903, Joplin, Missouri, white residents drove out Joplin's black residents following the lynching of a black transient for the murder of a white policeman. I don't know what a transient has to do with all the residents of an area, but, you know, transient somebody who's passing through or homeless. Um, July 9th, 1903, in Sour Lake, Texas, a mob of 500 white men opened fire on blacks and chased them out of Sour Lake after a brakeman was shot dead by a black man. A brakeman would have been on the railroad, I presume. 1906, Atlanta, Georgia, the Atlanta race riot left hundreds of black dead and two white people dead. There were a lot of, I live in Philadelphia, fair number of race riots in Philadelphia, almost always. Um, begun by mobs of white people attacking black people. Not, you know, not talking about some of the stuff happening in the 60s, but a whole lot through a century of time. October 1905 and January 1909 in Harrison, Arkansas, race riots in 1905 and 1909 resulted in the expulsion of Harrison's black community. August 24th, 1906 happened in Carter, Carter Arkansas, 1908. Marshall County, Kentucky, whites led by a local doctor drove out blacks from the now extinct city of Birmingham and most of the rest of Marshall County, Kentucky. November 1909, Anna and Jonesboro, Illinois after, the, Illinois, after the lynching of William Froggy James in nearby Cairo, Illinois, whites expelled Anna and Jonesboro's 40 black families. In 1911 and 1912, um, in Union, Georgia and Towns, Georgia, the black community, homeowners and business owners were expelled under terror threats by bands of night riders. They would have been like KKK night riders, giving them 24 hours to get out of town. Homes and businesses were abandoned and lost. September 1912, Forsyth County, Georgia, also covered in the movie, banished. After two, two attacks on white women blamed on black men and the lynching of one of them, a man named Rob Edwards, 98% of Forsyth, County, one, uh, Forsyth County's 1,000 black residents were expelled by organized bands of night riders. Homes and businesses were abandoned and lost. In July 1917, in East St. Louis, Illinois, um, the East St. Louis riots or East St. Louis massacres of late May and July 1st through 3rd, 1917 were an outbreak of labor and race-related violence by whites that caused the death of 40 to 250 black people and about 400,000, which would be over 8 million in 2017 US dollars in property damage. An estimated 6,000 black people were left homeless. Fall 1919, now understand 1919 became known as Red Summer for some of the things that happened in 1919, but we're not going deeply into that tonight. Um, fall 1919, Corbin, Kentucky, 200 black workers were forced to leave Corbin during a labor dispute. November 2nd through 3rd, 1920, Ocoee, Florida. Ocoee's black community was burned to the ground and nearly all of its 500 residents killed or expelled by whites after black men killed two whites in self-defense. At least 56 blacks were killed during the massacre. May 31st through June 1st, 1921, Tulsa, Oklahoma, as many as 300 black people were killed, 10,000 left homeless after armed white men attacked and destroyed Greenwood from the air and from the ground um, and, uh, and just, uh, 200 million in property damage. And it's now all white owned, right? So they're, you know, they drove out the black community and now the whole strip that was Greenwood and the whole area, the, the, it's, you know, it's white owned. Um, in January 1923, Rosewood, Florida. So you may also have seen or should see the movie Rosewood, trigger warning for the depiction of reality in Rosewood, but um, in the film. But Rosewood, Florida, whites attacked and completely burned down the town of Rosewood in Le Levy County or L-E-V-Y County after a black man allegedly raped a white woman probably not how that actually went down. At least eight people and perhaps as many as 150 people were killed. They were also, you know, just driven out. Rosewood is one of the few places where 
black where black residents ever received any reparations at all, and they were mighty little. 1923, Blandford, Indiana, the Ku Klux Klan led an expulsion of the black of the black community there. In 1954, in Vienna, Illinois, white residents burned down all the black homes of Vienna, Vienna and nearby areas outside the city limits. The expulsion was sparked by the murder of an elderly white woman and the attempted rape of her teenage granddaughter by two black men. So I want you to think about this for just, just a moment. Think about, this is, this is a, a long, long history. It's an ongoing history of white terrorism of black Americans and, and expulsion from their communities. I want you to think about what it would mean if your grandparents, great grandparents, if family trees, if your family members had been killed in these land theft, racial expulsions, right? This, this is, these are massacres and they are ways of, of removing the black community and ways of stealing the land. This was done to indigenous Americans before that, to the indigenous peoples that occupied this continent prior, right? So all of this land was initially native owned or uh, native occupied, inhabited by 50 to 100 million native peoples who had been here for 17,000 years or better. And then that's taken and it's taken through, you know, similar ways, massacres that are then blamed on Indians, right? They were Indians who attacked us. They were the Indian wars. They were, you know, they, they had to be stopped because they were fighting us, the white people, um, the United States. And actually, you know, they were being invaded and they were being, they were being murdered. They were being driven out. They were being occupied when they stayed. And then here, you know, um, Africans are brought in involuntarily by and large. And so most African Americans um, have you know, some connection to my, my peoples came here voluntarily. So we're all immigrants, but some of us voluntary, our, our elders, our ancestors were voluntary immigrants in this case, involuntary immigration, like capture and transport. And you know, your, your people, somebody survives the Middle Passage, somebody makes it, and for generations they are in, there's enslavement. And then finally, there's, you know, the, a successful bringing to an end this thing called race-based slavery. But then, you know, then people get up and people like, there's this continual rhetoric, why don't you pull yourself up by your bootstraps? And people will often say, well, if you don't have boots, you don't have bootstraps. But, you know, if you got boots, they'd take them away. They come in and say, eh, you know, you built some nice houses here, or you're getting too hot, you're getting too uppity, you got, you got, you have too much financial power, and we certainly don't want you, you know, in our state legislature. We certainly don't want, and right now, there's an ongoing attack, which we'll talk about another time, on voting rights. And a lot of it is about stopping black and brown people from voting. A lot of it is about, a lot of owning the libs and, and fighting the Dems is about, you know, the fact that, there's, you know, one party appears to be more on the side of human rights and civil rights, and another party appears to be more on the side of taking those away. But there's, you know, clearly a distinct desire not to have black and brown people weighing in. There's also a history of, so when we get to the history of lynching, which we're, we're not going to directly deal with um, in this video, but when we get to the history of lynching, individual lynching, um, but which often led to these massacres and expulsions. But when we, you know, we get to that, there's also a very strong um, history of lynching, also of Latinx Americans, particularly of Mexican Americans, especially in the Southwest, um, and also of, um, you know, lynching also of Asian Americans. And so this is, this is, these are race-based acts, and, and they are um, they're almost all going one way, right? So yes, there were, you know, occasional ac accusations that this one individual did something to this other individual, but instead of that one individual being put on trial, arrested and put on trial, instead it turns into an extrajudicial killing where that individual who's accused, instead of being 
arrested and, 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 you know, booked and going, you know, getting a lawyer and going to court and, and his or her innocence or guilt being proven. Instead, there's, in the, instead there's an extrajudicial killing where the person without trial is executed by a mob, right? And, and so, and then this is followed by a removal of the black community from this region. So again, think about the ongoing um, breaking of family lines and what that means. You know, there's already a, under, under race-based slavery, there's already frequent and, and ongoing sale of spouses away from each other, parents away from children, siblings away from each other, a breaking up of family connections. And yet African-Americans go on and build family connections and build communities and after, you know, at, at the right and get, take their freedom, get north, get, get to into the north, and then when the era of the Fugitive Slave Act, get up into Canada, you know, and, and try to build lives. And then after the end of slavery, build lives, build communities, you know, build black owned residential neighborhoods and, and, and business neighborhoods and, and do that kind of work and then taken away, taken away, taken away. And again, more murders, again, more killing of family members. And so this breaking of family lines, there's also that in the mass incarceration when we get to talking about that. And they'll think of the loss, right? Part of the, one of the things about the AIDS crisis of the uh, 1980s and 90s, particularly before the AIDS cocktail comes in and before the drugs that, that have made it air quotes manageable today. But um, in that, that first window, it's also the, um, today, I believe, yeah, Saturday, June 5th is the um, 40th anniversary of the first report of um, gay men in, I think, San Francisco with a particular odd kind of cancer and odd kind of lung disease, right? So that's just the, the beginning of the, uh, of the AIDS outbreak of what becomes the AIDS crisis. And so this is that 40th anniversary. But in, um, you know, one of the things about that is the loss of almost an entire generation, a huge portion of an entire generation of young gay males and their talents and their skills and, and what they would have meant as elders to younger gay people coming up as the gay rights movement made progress and, and just you know just what the devastation as, as gay people began to come out as a community, as a minority group and to come to that right and to stand together in solidarity to then lose this enormous, um, you know, literally just the, just the countless people that were lost, millions of people who were lost um, in the AIDS crisis, who are still being lost to AIDS and to HIV around the globe, but that pandemic and its effects. But it's particular when one thinks of its particular effects on, on the gay male community, which is multiracial, right? Which is white and black, and also the effect it had on, on the black community, the straight black community in the United States. Um, so, you know, it, it affected in huge numbers in those decades when there weren't medical treatments for it. It affected huge numbers of people, but it really cost this loss of skills and talents. In the same way, or in, you know, different, in, in also real measure, this um, very real loss of skills and talents and, and, and of upward motion. If my grandfather builds a successful business and then he shot and killed or you know, he's driven out of town and we lose that land and we lose that business and, and we're and we're trying getting trying to get going again. And then something happens where we go to and then we have to get going again. You're always having to start over again. The the disruption of that to um, to is a is a loss to all of us, right? It's a loss to to everyone in the United States. It's a loss particularly to the African American communities in the United States that you know, there's just these generations have been disrupted time and time again, because it doesn't stop with this, right? When we do begin, so there is a fight against lynching, there's a fight against this, this racial cleansing. Um, and that was air quotes around cleansing for those who don't see this, but hear it. Um, there's a, but this, this, um, there's this on this ongoing loss is not does not stop there. So so there is a fight, there's a resistance, the NAACP and, number, and people, you know, there's a, a, an uprising against lynching that begins to slow it down in the 40s and the 50s. Um, also the effects of 
African American men and as soldiers and women in, in the armed services um, going out being and and being empowered by their military service by their better treatment in Europe, coming back, expecting I serve my country, I expect to be treated with greater dignity. There was some of that effect in World War I and more of that effect perhaps in World War II or again in World War II. And so that, sh that shift in, in black consciousness that feeds into a rise of, of what we know is the civil rights movement though it was there all along. Um, the NAACP starts in, I think, 1909. Um, certainly, you know, from the end of the Civil War on, there are Black social justice movements that have risen out of the abolitionist movement and go on in the Freedmen's Movement for Education, and that go on in the movement that builds towns and communities and moves on into the Civil Rights Movement. So there's just this ongoing, there's Black resistance under slavery and there's Black empowerment movements and social justice movements from the end of slavery forward. And it's just a continual ongoing stream of social justice you know struggle and and those who were in that struggle but as this is you know going on there's also this backlash that comes that continually disrupts and so just this constant this constant this press for forward motion and this constant knocking back they say about social justice movements that there's this, this corkscrew effect we make two steps forward we get knocked back one step by the backlash and that is the hope is that we always end up at least one step forward from where we had started in our struggle. But think about the economic implications. Think about the emotional and family implications of this continual assault on black communal life in the United States and black family life from the really from the end of the Civil War, certainly from the end of Reconstruction all the way through into the 1940s and 50s when that, that particular effect starts to slow down and the civil rights movement is rising, but then the coming back again, that happens immediately at the close of what we know of as the civil rights movement, which really ended through the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, through the assassination of Malcolm X, through the assass assassination of the leaders of the Black Power Movement and the Black Panther Party, just really, um, you know, ways in which that movement was brought to a halt. Or as Gloria Steinem would say about one of the ways you end social justice movements is to tell them they accomplished their goals, right? That's one of the things that happened to what we now call second wave feminism is, oh, it's all better now, you've, you've won it. Or even to first wave feminism, you got the vote, it's all better now. And so, you know, you get told, oh, this is a, you have you have civil rights, you won this, you know, you got a voting rights act, and you got a civil rights act, and, and it's all better now, the voting rights act. They took the teeth out. And, um, and if we look at that, where is that right now? In literally almost every state, voting rights are under absolute assault. And so um, I want to just uh, bring us up to speed with where we are. And again, whenever, whatever year in which this video is being viewed, as of this day, June 5th, 2021, the Confirmed cases in the United States of COVID-19 are 34,192,759. So over 34 million. Around the globe, the confirmed cases and understanding again, the people who are dying in India, excuse me, many of the people who died early in the pandemic in the United States, a year ago this time, people still couldn't get tested, um, but, 173,489,173 confirmed cases. The numbers are probably five or six times that if because there has not been adequate testing in so many places so much of the time, including developed nations. But oh, 173 million and a half. Around the globe, um, it is now at 3,731,598 deceased. And the, the deaths in the United States are 612,265. I use ENCODE2019.live as my COVID tracker, and I have been using that this whole time for consistency's sake. Its numbers are just a touch higher than the CDC, but it takes into it, trying to take into account some stuff that might not be encountered, be being encountered. 
but we are over 612,000 dead in the United States. In the United States at present, the number of deaths per day is down from our height somewhere at over 5,000 um, a day in, uh, at the height of this in, in the winter of 2021, like um, early 2021. January-ish 2021 um, and down now to uh, 428 a day. And this is because the vaccination rates in the United States, so the vaccination program is succeeding at this present time. Um, and those who have not gotten the vaccine, please don't trust the virus. Please trust the vaccine, not the virus. Those in India who are currently dying at the rate of three, well, it's over 3,000 a day, 3,382, I believe, a day right now in, um, in India. But um, those who are dying in India, and that's, that's an undercount because in rural India, there's no record keeping, there's no hospitals, there's no oxygen, there's no treatment, there's no vaccines, there's nothing. People are simply um, dumping their dead in the, in the Ganges River, they're washing up on shore, they, don't even have the money to cremate them, or you know, just they're they've got open parking lots, just burning bodies upon bodies upon bodies. It's just overwhelming and overwhelming in other places as well. So um, if you have the Western privilege to get vaccinated, you do all of us a favor and help us fully bring this under control in the United States by getting vaccinated. If you're over 12 years old right now, you can get it almost anywhere in this country. You can find, you can walk into some place nearby you. Um, yet in most places you don't need an appointment anymore and it is free for everyone. If you don't have insurance, it doesn't matter. You don't even need to have insurance. You just need to walk in. I don't even know if you need, I mean, I guess you need to give your real name, but um, you should, because you should want that CDC card because you may need it someday to fly or, um, you know, visit your friendly local practitioner of some kind or another. Um, you know, your local business person may have a, a right to want to know who's coming in their store. But anyway, um, there is no federal mandate for, it, um, for any such thing in the United States. But you can expect that there will be jobs where you'll need to be vaccinated if you want to be employed by that place or schools, as we have vaccine requirements for children in schools for all the other vaccines and there are some exemptions, but mostly there are requirements that this, this will be one of those. So, you know, just, it's a great relief uh, to be vaccinated and to do two or three weeks past your second dose and to know that at present the science is that that makes you really relatively well protected. So anyway, um, 612,000 American dead. And so, um, and 37, uh, 3,700,000 in the globe. So um, that we've counted, I've confirmed people and the numbers many times now. So, uh, you know, whenever you're watching this sometime in the future, you will know how this worked out. You will know what new variants did or didn't do to us and what percentage of Americans did or did not get vaccinated and what all that meant um, as we removed mask mandates and opened things. And, and so, you know, if you're still here. Um, so anyway, uh, with me, understand that through all of this violence against Black communities and African American people in the United States. That overwhelmingly, Black people have held the hope and the desire to believe in the American dream. And the American dream is not, it's not really home ownership, though. Certainly, it would have been nice not to be removed from Tulsa, right? But it's actually about liberty and freedom. It's about being a citizen, not a consumer. It's about a place where we, where diversity is accepted and included, where it doesn't matter that you're Italian and I'm Irish and some and, and you're black and you're Latinx and you're Asian or Pacific Islander, where, where it's all where, where, we're, where we recognize each other 
in shared humanity, where we have true democracy, where we all have the right to vote, like easily, and like where they can give us bottles of water as we wait in line, or where we have sufficient polling places in our neighborhood and they don't get shut down, and where we can, you know, vote by mail if we apply properly and just, you know, you have to register to vote, right? Um, but just that, that space, being an American is about those ideals, those, those pretty words. President Biden said it on, in his Memorial Day speech. He talked about America being an idea, an ideal. It's, a, it's an ideology. It's not, he's like, you know, other, other nations, their, their, na their nationhood is based on geography or shared bloodlines of descent or, you know, whatever. This is, this is not that. In part because most of the indigenous population of the Americas were removed or massacred. And um, overwhelmingly the population currently inhabiting this, these, well, this land, this continent from the northern tips of Canada down to the south tip of South America, overwhelmingly the peoples are European immigrants and African immigrants and immigrants from, from all around the globe, right? Immigrants from India, immigrants from Asia, immigrants from, you know, immigrants coming up from South America, coming into North America, but overwhelmingly, and there are continue, there continue to be, you know, living indigenous Americans who also have above all of us the right to be here. But the ideals of the system of government that um, got put into place after the genocide of Native Americans and during the enslavement of Africans, right? Native Americans and African Americans. After, after those and during, they wrote these pretty words about, you know, liberty and justice for all, about the right, about inalienable rights, about the right to the pursuit of happiness, right? They, they wrote pretty words. And, and what's happened in the two centuries plus since those pretty words were penned is that, Emer that every group that has come here has said, uh, uh, me too. And that's actually the American dream. My grandparents who were immigrants who came here were not coming particularly, you know, they weren't coming with the thought. They did want a house, I'm sure, because we all need shelter, but they weren't coming here with the intent of like, you know, being the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I, mean, I, I know they came well before that television show, but they weren't coming thinking they were going to like, just be rich. I, I know that that image has been sold by television and movies around the globe, but they were coming long enough ago that they were just coming in the hopes of being able to live in a country where they would be free of government interference and allowed without authoritarianism to live free lives and become citizens and vote and, you know, and raise their children and, you know, try to make it better for their kids and try to pass that on. And that remains the true American dream is actually all of our social justice movements demanding civil and human rights. And this history that we have of race in the United States has not lived up to that. But we are a thinking species. And when we know where we have been, we can accurately assess where we are and why we're where we are. And we can decide how to make it better in the future.